Ripple Puddle. Welcome to Ripple Puddle. Welcome to Ripple Puddle. Ripple Puddle is a weaving of true stories that connect us in the human experience. Each episode gains at giving our audience new insight into themselves and others around them. Using philosophy, history, art, the sciences, and music, we guide our listener to access their playfulness, emotional intelligence, connectivity, and the desire to discover. We are the ripples in this big puddle, and we are connected by our stories. Oh, the moments of seemingly disastrous mistakes. I always have trouble remembering the Chinese proverb that goes something along the lines of, everything will one day be a hundred years past. Is that right? Where did I read that? Oh shit, never mind. Scratch that. I'm Carla Taylor, and you're listening to episode eight. Oh shit. Dark energy accounts for more than 70% of the universe, but until 1998, we didn't even know it existed. Now we know it's the dominant energy in the universe, the connectors between perceivable space. Beliefs that were once culturally relevant change slowly, quietly. What once made sense no longer seems to anymore. Psychology professor Ellen Langer says that this is because most of us operate on an inactive state of mind, characterized by reliance on distinct categories drawn from the past. What we've perceived through the frame of our reality can cause all types of oh shit in our lives. Here's Chad Diatley and Brandy Beakley with their story. Uh, I never really planned on getting married. Well, we had to plan it really fast, though, because we decided to get married when we were shit canned at your birthday party because Chris Tucker was like, when are y'all going to get married? And we'd had a bunch of vodka. We told her we were going to get married August 19th. I came home and sent out an Evite drunk. So that's why we had so many people at our wedding and it was just a reception because we invited a hundred people. Yeah. So we had to get married. That's why we actually really got married. <laughs> there were several people that said it was the best wedding they ever went to because it avoided all the usual, you know, religious subtext. And, and pageantry. Pageantry. There was no pageantry. There was a lot of funk music. We both got pretty drunk. Then uh, what was the name of the hotel that we were staying at? Zaza. Zaza. So this is a, one of the top hotels in, in Dallas. But it's a, it's a place that we had no business being there. After our wedding, we made a brief stop at a bar to get more drunk. So we went to the hotel, we checked in, got into our hotel, and I'm pretty sure we had plans to, you know. <laughs> I put, yeah. I put uh, on some lingerie. <laughs> But first, we were very hungry. Both of us were very hungry. And there's a gas station that was across the way that had a Dickies built into it. Uh, and so I was thinking like, I'll run and get some barbecue sandwiches or something for us to have some fuel for our hot wedding sex. Did we call? No, there was, <laughs> you wanted the you Dickies. can't reveal. <laughs> you wanted the Dickies, that was the point. All right, maybe I, okay, so I was just like, fuck it, we're getting barbecue. This is 2007, so this is during the Bush years. I was beyond fed up with our political situation and living in Dallas. So I walk downstairs, the first thing I see is this fucking Hummer with George W sticker on it. The back, It was just a W sticker. And in my mind, basically I was like, I'm gonna key that fucking Hummer. And I did, I pulled my keys out and I walked next to the Hummer and just walked the length of the fucking Hummer. Just scrape. And once I got up to the passenger window, I realized that the people were still in the car. There was a man and a woman in, in the front two seats. Um, and when I made my way, scraping all the way to the uh, passenger window, a woman was looking at me horrified. It was a black couple. Anyway, my first reaction was to just act like I was crazy. So when I saw her face looking at me horrified, I decided just to step it up and just, uh, and I started just banged on her window and just screamed, just like, ah! And they were looking at me, I'm wearing my wedding shirt, which is a, the Mexican wedding shirt and uh, I have a big beard. So I looked especially crazy, I'm sure, to this woman. But I was just banging on her window, screaming at her. And I saw the guy next to her who was obviously like 
big athletic man and which was more horrifying to me i was like this guy's gonna beat the shit out of me and so i did that and then i just walked away i did not run i walked away and i occasionally would turn and look at them and get shoot them a crazy look and they were mortified i mean they they were paralyzed it, like every time i looked back you could tell they were just like what the fuck is going on and so I just walked away and took a right turn into the parking lot where, where my truck was parked. As soon as I turned the corner, I just sprinted to my car, got into my car and put the seat down and was breathing heavy, just going, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. I decided I was just going to wait there, just wait it out. I, all I start seeing is like flashlights and cop cars and there's a crazy amount of police that showed up for a guy keying the car. There's police just all over, and I can hear them, and I, you know, knock my seat back so I couldn't, my head wouldn't be sticking up. So I couldn't really, every once in a while, I'd peek out and see just this swarm of police officers. The aforementioned driver of the car just standing there with his elbows just nodding and just like, yeah, obviously giving a description of me. So I'm just sitting in my car. It's, it's kind of dying off the activity, and so I decided to get out of my car for some reason. At this point, I'm just thinking, like, I gotta get back into the hotel. And as soon as I did that, I got outside of the car. I'm sitting in front of my car, kind of looking around, and three cops, like, they walk around the corner. I accidentally pushed the lock button on my truck, so it, it lit up and went boop, boop. All of a sudden, the cops were just, go to that car right there. And so I dove behind some bushes, and I just saw these three or four cops just around my car, just looking at it, trying to open it up, and like looking at like looking underneath with flashlights. And I'm slowly just moving away, moving away in these bushes that are there. I just stayed very still until that activity went away. And it seemed like everything was all right. Um, and I saw the Hummer move down the street a little bit. They were going to a club. I, I was running around the whole time, just trying to get out of sight. I ran down into some more bushes and was looking at the guy coming out of the Hummer and he's talking to the door guy. And I think I thought that they couldn't see me. I was looking over bushes, just staring at him. I see the guy talking to the doorman and he shifts, looks right at me and points his fingers like, there's the guy right there. And so I turned around and just ran into more bushes. I just went to, I went across the street in McKinney and I was in more bushes trying to disguise myself. All of a sudden there's more cops looking around and uh, trying to find me. And that kind of calmed down. I started moving towards the hotel through the back way. I'm going through bushes. I'm leaning low. I'm doing like an army crawl on my elbows. And that's when, honest to God, I spot a helicopter with a spotlight coming down. I'm thinking to myself, like, surely that's that's not for me. Um, it was. They were shining the light everywhere around me. I buried myself into these bushes. It was very uncomfortable. The spotlight came down right on me. The helicopters continued to go around for, I can't tell you how long it was. It was insane. Everything dies down. I'm gonna go in through the back way, into the parking garage of the hotel, and go up to my room. That amazingly worked out for me. I went through the parking garage, uh, went to the elevator in the parking garage, went up to my room to find my bride passed out on the bed with a fucking pizza that she had called room service for. So she'd already eaten a pizza and just passed out. Yeah, you failed to even mention that uh, it was like 2.45 when you went for Dickies. Like Dickies was gonna be open at 2.45 in the morning. That was not a smart move at all. So I come in, I'm freaking the fuck out, of course. I find her a razor that for shaving her legs and just proceed to shave my beard off. I'm really scared at that point, but really tired. So we just go to sleep. Oh, I forgot. No, you were forgetting going down, back down. You I went forgot. back downstairs. I, yeah, I, I, I went. Clothes. I uh, changed clothes, shaved my beard. And I walked downstairs. You wanted and, to move your car. And I wanted to get my car out of there. <laughs> yeah. So I got my truck and I moved it into the parking garage because I was like, that'll solve things. And I had to talk to somebody at one point and they were kind of just looking at me funny like, this truck is, is wanted for some things. And I was like, my, <laughs> my truck? 
What? I don't. I got married tonight. I am <laughs> on my honeymoon. <laughs> on my honeymoon right now. I'm at Zaza, and why would I? What? So I parked, went upstairs, went to bed. We woke up in the morning. I think the first thing I said to you. No. Okay. We woke up the next morning and I rolled over to you and went to give you a kiss and you didn't have a beard. <laughs> when, I, right. when I went to bed the night before, you had a beard. So I said, what happened to your beard? And then you said. I might get arrested today. <laughs> yeah. There's a pretty good chance I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> that. I explain the situation to her. And then I get to hear the whole thing start, like all the way up to me right then. I felt like I was in Pulp Fiction. He made me swear never to tell anybody that story, that this was someone really important or they wouldn't have sent helicopters out. Like five months later, I had a brunch with a lot of the girls that helped with my wedding and I, I couldn't stand it anymore. And so I had to tell the story we were sitting at Torelli's. So I tell this story that I've been sworn to my husband that I will never tell anybody. I look over and I mean, of course, everyone is like, their mouths are just wide open and they can't believe it. But our, our neighbor that lived one house down from us, like in the only McMansion in our historic neighborhood, she has like this really horrified look on her face. And she just goes, uh, that's Mike's her law partner. Her husband's a lawyer. Her husband's it's, a lawyer. It's her, it's her law partner. Yeah, his law, his law partner. And, she, and I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, about a six foot six black guy, black Hummer, W sticker on the back. He lives at Zaza. And so we knew that they were close enough that we had maybe even met this dude before because they'd been our neighbors for about three years. So she goes, he comes to the house, Brandy, and... Like and all the time. Like all the time. And I went home and told Chad, he flipped out. He was like, he cannot come around here. He cannot, he'll notice my truck. And it was, it was kind of like after that that we, we started looking for another place to live. <laughs> I don't know if that was the motivation to... Yeah, it just lined up, really. It, it, we moved it four weird. months later. A disgruntled chef sent out a thin sliced deep fried potato to a customer who had complained the restaurant's fried potatoes were too fat, soggy, and bland. And that's how we got potato chips. In 1905, an 11-year-old boy was mixing his favorite soda drink out of powder and water. This was a popular drink back then. His mother called him inside for the night, and he forgot the drink outside in the cold, with the swizzle stick still inside. And now, popsicles! Yum! You can thank the owners of the Toll House Inn for inventing the chocolate chip cookie. Ruth Wakefield was rushing to bake her delicious butter drop cookies when she realized she was out of baker's chocolate. So she improvised by using chunks of Nestle's chocolate. The chocolate didn't melt as expected, but her guests didn't seem to mind. She kind of became famous for them. Mmm, good shit. Mmm, good shit. A momentary act of surprise can leave a powerful wake. Here's Tom with his story. Oh, and for sensitive listeners, discretion is advised. So when I was 18, I joined the Marine Corps. And after three months of boot camp, I uh, went back to California to the mountains for some additional combat training. And this combat training was the next level from what we had learned in boot camp. So it was all live ammunition, live grenades, real explosions, you know, making it as warlike as possible. This was in 1992. So Gulf War I had ended a year before. And so everyone was still on pretty high alert. One day for our training, they took us out to the grenade range. And the grenade range um, consisted of large empty field, as you would think, with some simulated targets 20 yards away or so. Then on the near end, there were 10 six foot tall. There were just three sides, 
And on the back side, the side that you would enter, the wall was not there. So you would go into it and they had um, set these shacks, these roofless shacks right on the ground, on the dirt, and then dug away the dirt in the center to make about a two foot hole that you could barely fit kind of two people in. I was six foot tall at the time, a little taller now, and they were about my height when I wasn't in them. But once I got in, even for me, it was an eight foot high wall. And then on the front wall, they had, instead of just the wall itself, they had some sort of bulletproof glass or some sort of polymer. So when you were throwing your grenades, you could aim and see where it went, watch the explosion, etc. Now, when you're handing live grenades to a group of 60, 18 year olds, you want to have some security measures in place. You want to make sure you have done it in training. You've done it in practice. You practice with the fake grenades. These things, you know, have a about a 10 or 15 meter kill radius. So you don't want to have somebody all willy nilly. So we were very specifically told, you know, how we were going to hold our hands, the direction that we were going to be given. And in each of the uh, grenade shacks, there was an instructor. There was someone who was going to make sure that you did it right, make sure that they were the ones giving the commands, make sure that everything was safe. A few down from me, there was a young Marine, about the same age as me. He was a smaller Marine. He was only maybe five, six, five, seven. So when he got into that dugout pit in the shack, it was way above his head. You know, it was an eight foot high wall. So he had three feet or more to throw over. And the way that the instructions basically went, you would hold your hands kind of in a cup position on your chest. They would place the grenade in your hands. You would wrap both hands around it. They would give you the command to pull the pin the timer on a grenade is variable. It could be between three and five seconds. So we were always taught after we pull the pin and make the grenade live that you would count one 1,000, two 1,000. On your two 1,000, that's when you would throw. And then there was no chance for the enemy to catch the grenade and then throw it back to you before it exploded. It would at least explode near them or at worst case, you know, hit the ground and then no one has time within us one second to pick it up and throw it back. So that was the instruction and that was what we were doing. But what you understand is the grenades don't just go off the minute you pull the pin. So this five foot six young brand new Marine gets into the pit there with his instructor who was a captain Gulf War One veteran, father, husband, and a really nice guy. We, you know, met him a couple different times because we were fairly early on in training. And this young Marine gets his grenade, He's following all the procedures the captain is giving him. He's doing everything correctly. He pulls the pin. He's getting ready. The final uh, security measure is a little metal flange we call the spoon, which is on a uh, spring that pops off. And that's what actually sets the timer is the spoon. So this young Marine pulls the pin, cocks his arm back, throws the grenade. The grenade hits the top of the cinder block and bounces right back down into the hole that they are standing in. So worst case scenario at this point, they have about two and a half seconds, two, two and a half seconds, best case, you know, four seconds to do something without hesitating, without thinking, without just reacting, pure reaction. The captain grabs this 130 pound Marine. Luckily he was small, I suppose, and heaves him out of the hole and bends down to cover up, retrieve something, the grenade, which then goes off right there in the hole. So that killed the captain. Um, he did not make it. No one else was injured. The young Marine uh, was completely safe. We had a uh, memorial service for him on base where his wife and, and children came and they were presented with the flag. We all saluted her and, and you know, the, the sacrifice that he made. He only had a couple of seconds and he chose to do his job, to do what Marines do and threw that kid out of the hole and saved his life at the cost of his own. Yeah, I think that's it. Perceptual shift. The income of topless dancers depends not only on the attributes we might expect, 
but on something less obvious, their fertility cycle. Near the most fertile point of a woman's cycle, just before ovulation, for instance, lab experiments have shown that facial attractiveness peaks, the waist to hip ratio shrinks, and body scent reaches its most appealing level. Hapless dancers taking birth control pills consistently earned less than dancers who weren't on the pill. Most people who change their answers on a test improve their test scores. Switching from task to task causes us to forget what we were working on in the first place. In some cases, the forgetting rate can be as high as 40%. Workplace studies have found it takes up to 15 minutes for us to regain a deep state of concentration after a distraction such as a phone call. April 2008, 13-year-old boy corrected NASA's estimates on the chances that an asteroid would collide with the Earth. Twelve hundred years before René Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, the philosopher and theologian Augustine wrote, Valor ergo sum, I err, therefore I am. Being wrong, it's not only part of being alive, but it's to some degree evidence of it. Though shit happens, and painful or full of humiliation as these events may seem, they allow room for our own evolution, or at the very least leave us with a good story to tell. Here's Anne. Every Friday, there are two young guys who come to my apartment to clean. They're sent from the cleaning service I hired four years ago. I don't know these two guys' names. I know they're young, they're in their 20s, because I've crossed paths with them here and there. They're coming in, I'm going out. But usually they come when I'm at work, so I don't see them. I don't even know their names. But I've made up biographies for them. I tell my friends that they're both in a rock band. They're just cleaning houses till they make it, till they're the next Nirvana. So I got two boys in a rock band who clean my apartment. Now, my apartment is a private place for me. It's my sanctuary. I don't even have many friends who've been in my apartment. It's where I go to be alone, where I go to relax. So it's weird for me that I have these two guys who come every week whose names I don't know, and they. They come in and they get to touch my stuff. So every Friday morning before they get to my place, I get up, I get up real early and I, I have a routine. I go around the apartment and I pick up stuff. I go around, I empty all the trash cans, make sure I don't have any tampons or any personal trash that somebody could see. I don't, like, no hairball. I clean off all the surfaces. I put my mail away. I, I put my books away. You don't even know what I'm reading. I put all my vitamins up in a cabinet. You don't know what I'm taking every day. I take all my underwear off the drying rack in the bathroom and I put that away. So they're not gonna know what kind of underwear I wear. And I rearrange that drawer, my bedside table. You know, the goody drawer where you keep your, your condoms, your vibrator. I always make sure that I take that stuff and I put it in a box and I tuck it in the back of the drawer. So even if you open the drawer, you wouldn't be able to see. And then the last thing I do is I go get clean sheets and I put them by the bed because the guys always change my sheets. And I do that every Friday morning. So on a recent Friday, I got up early like I always do, and I, I did my routine. I walked around the apartment, emptied all the trash cans, I made sure all the surfaces were empty, no vitamins out, no mail out, no books out. I make sure that I don't have anything sitting by my bedside table, all my mugs are put away, there are no glasses hanging out. I've taken all my shoes, I put them in the closet, there's, there's nothing out, it's just empty surfaces empty floors, about as impersonal as a personal space could be. And I go off to work feeling confident as I always do. And I'm tucked away and these boys are going to come and not going to find out anything about me. That evening when I come home and I open the door, I get that, that burst of clean smell. You know, that, 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 there's a little hint of lemon. You can faintly smell the cleaning products. You know, how, that great feeling that I've come home to my favorite place. It's all clean. I can see the floor shiny from being mopped. The surfaces in the kitchen all shiny from being wiped down. The floor is vacuumed. And I'm heading to my bedroom and I peek through the door and I, my bed is all made up. And I walk into the room and I think, oh shit. Cause sitting on my bedside table, right in the middle of the table, 
push right up to the edge so that there was no way I could miss it was my hot pink rubber vibrator. I must have left it under a pillow. And those boys had found it, and instead of tucking it in the drawer so that I would never know that they had discovered this thing about me. And now I knew these boys, whose names I didn't know, they knew that I kept a bright, hot pink rubber vibrator with really shiny silver trim. I turned 40 a while ago and at some point in my life I decided things just needed to be different and I came to this realization after Christmas this year when I was out shopping with one of my gift cards and I was out shopping with my friend and I'm trying on a million different things and I just said, you know what, that's just it. I am done in my life. I am not getting anything else in my life that is not just absolutely fabulous. That's my hot tip. Don't take anything else into your life that's not absolutely fabulous. Ben Franklin said, Perhaps the history of errors of mankind, all things considered, is more valuable and interesting than that of their discoveries. Truth is uniform and narrow. It constantly exists and does not seem to require so much an active energy as a passive aptitude of soul in order to encounter it. But error is endlessly diversified. It has no reality, but is the pure and simple creation of the mind that invents it. In this field, the soul has room enough to expand herself, to display all her boundless faculties and all her beautiful and interesting extravagancies and absurdities. So our truths have to be out there. All we have to do is just seek them out. But in doing that, we must invite error as part of the process. It can't be eliminated. And you never know. Sometimes the errors come from our own deep unconscious understanding of what we really want, what we really need. Here's Melissa to share her story. Something about my background that I've put together in recent years is that I was sort of a little queen of my family. I had older brothers, and I was the only girl, and I came from a very conservative family. My parents were cattle ranchers. When I was a little girl, I pretty much ruled the ranch. You know, I had my own horse. I got to go out with my dad every day. We would go out and count the cows and feed the cows and make sure everybody was safe. And if there was anybody missing, then we would go ride our horses into the woods and we'd round up we'd find the cow, you know, that was probably having a baby and we'd watch her to make sure that she didn't have trouble. And if she did have trouble, then we had a whole situation that we went to where we pulled the calf together and my dad and I were essentially best friends. And when that changed for me was around the sixth grade when I started to sprout these little walnut breasts and I started being a little bit of a contrarian. Things just sort of changed. There was something about my dad and his particular psychology. I see now, looking back, he, he was not able to relate to women as friends. He was a great flirt. I, I wouldn't say that he was, you know, inappropriate. He just didn't have the software to relate to women. He could relate to older women. He could relate to children. He could relate to women who were beautiful in a flirtatious way, but he really struggled with me. And his um, answer to that particular problem, I guess, that he saw my development as was to just completely dump me. (laughs) And he was still around. After I started developing, I mean, I, I never got to get on my horse anymore. I never got to go out on the ranch anymore. I was sort of sort of outsourced to the general women's roles around the house. And so I spent time with my mother and my grandmothers making the food and doing all the stuff that wasn't as fun. I guess there was a long period of malcontent that manifested in, in me for a long time. 
It was a time when I worked for a friend of my mother's, and she had opened this sort of upscale dress shop in our hometown. I was the only employee. We had very few customers. Some would come in, and I was sort of the shop girl that showed them around. One day, I was sitting there. In walks this beautiful girl and this sort of fussing entourage. It was the reigning pageant queen from our town. And they came in and they stayed forever. You know, they bought tons of dresses and got her ready for her Miss Texas experience. It really left an impression on me. On some level, I saw that she was the center of the universe. And by God, that was what I was going to be. During my high school years, I started to read Richard Brodigan books and I became fascinated with the whole hippie culture. A real backstage part of my adolescence behind the student council and the piano lessons and the drill team and everything, I, I, I would kind of go home and read. I have always just had this, this tingle, this fascination, this love for people who reach way out, reach way off the grid. Around the time that the pageant took place was my senior year in high school. I had just gotten my hands on a copy of Helter Skelter, which is this book about the Manson family, the Charles Manson followers that ended up with, in such a bloodbath. And it was just a horrible take on hippie culture, the whole thing. Apparently, he was so charismatic that he could literally walk into a department store, walk up to a girl in a shop, probably not unlike the one that I worked in. You know, one of these girls hopped over the counter and took off with him, and her parents never saw her again. Around the time of the pageant, I was going through the motions of walking the walk and talking the talk and doing the spins on the runway and, and playing my my Texas Trilogy Concerto on the piano. And I don't think I ever really thought about whether I was going to win or lose. I think I just had it in my head that there was nothing else that could happen, but that I would win. And it was a complete and utter redemption process in my mind. And I remember this. I can feel this in my body still, you know, 30 years later. I never said it. I never verbalized it to anybody. But I thought when I am on that runway and I am crowned, then my dad, you know, he's going to see what he's missed. He's going to be so proud of me. He's going to open his arms and welcome me back into this life that, that at this point I'd probably been pining for for around six years, you know. It came the weekend of the pageant. It was kind of a drawn out process. You know, you have luncheons and you have all the society babes helping out with the pageant. And they had these judges and I don't know where they came from. They were just from larger towns and some of them were men, you know, like bald headed men with bow ties on. And some of them were snooty women with glasses on the tips of their noses. Saturday morning of the pageant, you'd go into this private room and they would ask you a number of questions. Literally, they are the pageant questions. One of the questions that they asked me, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, anyone living or dead, who has made some sort of impact on history, who would that person be? Well, without a moment's hesitation, I said, Charles Manson. <laughs> Because it was true. I wanted to have dinner with that dude. I wanted to see what was so damn charismatic about this short little ugly guy who had tons of sex with all these women and, and controlled all these minds and got people, groups of people to do despicable things to innocent people. You know, what was this guy like? And, you know, hell yes, I wanted to have dinner with Charles Manson. I wanted to see what that was all about. I wanted to see what his, what tricks were up his sleeve. And um, I, I really don't think that there are words to describe the, the looks on these <laughs> Miss Texas beauty pageant judges' faces. Really, I think it was done then. Even though I had practiced my piano piece for two years, I had done everything I could, spent, you know, as much as I could on a, a beautiful swimsuit. I had bedazzled my very own gown. I even went to other lengths 
One of the society babes that was helping with the pageant pulled me aside at one of the pageant rehearsals and and told me that I really needed help in the breast department. She said, uh, my mother is dying of breast cancer and she's had a double mastectomy and she has a prosthetic and I'm going to fetch that for you. And I said, is that legal? She said, oh yes, honey, everything's legal in a pageant. So there came a time when I did my piano. I rocked it. It was amazing. I did my prosthetic swimsuit walk. I rocked it. I also felt very confident about my evening gown. And then at the end, we all got to come out one by one and they asked us a question again. (laughs) And I don't remember what the question was, but I do know that at that point in time, all roads led back to Helter Skelter for me. So I ended up talking about Charles Manson. I was trying to stand up straight, shoulders back, prosthetic chest out, chin out, chin lifted. My makeup was perfect and I was articulating perfectly about Charles Manson. So I didn't see what the fucking problem was. Needless to say, I didn't even place in that pageant. And I was really, really surprised. Afterwards, I was extremely depressed. You know, now I understand that anytime you align your thoughts about yourself with a particular identity and then that's ripped from you, that is disorienting. It's it's painful for me still right now. It's painful for me to talk about because it's embarrassing and it was heartbreaking. Yet, I can see how it was one of those wrinkles in time where if I would have gained that crown somehow and gone on to the Miss Texas pageant, I might have been a totally different person. (laughs) But I turned out all right. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I ended up being a writer and an English professor. And two years ago, I started writing my first novel. You know, it's funny, until I started talking about telling this story, I never really drew the line between this event and and all these years later. But my novel, it's about hippies. (laughs) It's about this charismatic leader and and this commune and this, um, this sort of girl that doesn't really know who she is or what she's doing and and she's very sure she knows what she is and what she's doing but she stumbles into this counterculture and it completely shakes up her world and causes her to question everything that she's ever been taught or believed in and she's a scholar Part two of Melissa's story, where she tells us more about the complex relationships between adult children and their parents, will kick off our next episode, Memorization. You've just heard Chad Datley, Brandy Beakley, Tom Ainsworth, Anne Miano, and Melissa Ragsdale. Hot tip by Alicia Zander. The music you heard in this episode was performed by Jazz Mills, Angelina Lucero, Rose Whipper with Mark Stowe, and Kai Angle, to name a few. Most of the research material was sourced from the World Wide Web, as well as Ellen Langer's book, The Power of Mindful Learning, Why We Make Mistakes by Joseph Hallinan, and Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error by Katherine Schultz, to name a few. If you'd like to learn more about this episode, visit our website, www.ripplepuddle.com. Ripple Puddle is produced by Carla Taylor, with assistant production from Brooke Salisbury and collaborative production from Melissa Ragsdale. Theme music by Stephanie Hafer. Hot Tips theme by Broke for Free and Carla Taylor. If you'd like to pitch a story, email us at ripplepuddle at gmail.com or leave a message on our tip line, 313-389-6013. Thanks for listening. Remember to review our podcast on iTunes. Give us stars, write about us, and tell a friend. Every review makes a difference and helps us know that we're resonating with you. Stay tuned for our upcoming constructive interference due out in just a few weeks. This and much more.